This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. All right, y'all. It's Philip 40 Watt Podcast coming at you. Appreciate y'all tuning in today. We're going to talk about a couple of things, but before we do, let's get some house cleaning, housekeeping, whatever you want to call it, out of the way. Um, y'all really appreciate you tuning in. So you're already either listening to the podcast or you are watching it on YouTube. Please do me a favor on YouTube. Hit the hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell icon to know when I post videos. Um, if you are listening to the podcast, please do me a favor. Hit Follow, subscribe, whatever they call it on your app that you're using. Uh, leave us a review. Leave us a rating. It helps us find other listeners. I really appreciate it. You can email the podcast at 40 wattpodcast at gmail.com and uh, tell me what you think. Tell me if you want to be on the show. Give me question, topic ideas, whatever you want to leave there. Uh, we also have a Patreon where you can support the podcast. Uh, shout out to Jeff and Kyle, my Patreons that I've got so far. Patrons, Patreons, I don't know what to actually call them. A uh, couple of folks who support what the podcast does. I really appreciate y'all. Uh, come join the team. I'll send you stickers and other stuff as I get it. Um, and 25% of the revenue I make from Patreon goes to charities. Uh, my charity at the end of this year is going to be St. Jude. So 25% of everything I bring in this year through Patreon. Patreon is going to go to St. Jude. Uh, y'all help some kids who are go- going through some pretty rough times. I raise money for St. Jude every year anyway, and this is just one more way I can do it. Um, also, find us on Facebook, uh, uh, Instagram. We're not on Twitter. I'm probably not going to do the Twitter thing. It's just it's too much. Um, uh, we also have a Discord for our Patreon supporters. So, well, the, the three of us hang out over there. Uh, so if you want to support the show, really appreciate it. In the meantime, we're going to get to my guest. Y'all like how I got through all the housekeeping in under three minutes. I like getting straight to the interviews. Uh, so we've got Rick, Rick, I'm going to call you Rick and picks are way too close, but I got Rick Calhoun from honey picks on the show all the way from North Carolina. Y'all, if you haven't seen honey picks yet, you need to go follow honey picks on Instagram I uh, think you also have an Etsy store, and and do you sell direct through your website? Uh, I I've got the Etsy store, okay. and I've got a website coming, and okay. it's pretty much ready to go. I'm just waiting for the the whole like legal LLC thing to be done and finalized, and gotcha. All that. But as soon as that's done, we'll be up and ready to get. Oh, nice! Yeah, I, I went yeah. through the LLC for the podcast a little while back, and like we're, this is registered. We're a legit business. Uh, you know, for yeah. the, all the little bit of actually, I did it mostly instead of that's way off topic. Forty watt podcast instead of doing the podcast, I did forty watt productions. So like all of my live gigging, yeah. all of my sound that I run every now and again, any consulting work I do, all of it can just be put under one big umbrella, uh, which is it's nice. But y'all go check out Instagram. Y'all go check out the Etsy store. Rick is making some of the most insane picks I've ever seen. Now, before y'all turn off, before y'all go away, before you're like, how on earth can picks be interesting? Before you stop, pause this podcast, pause this video, go look at the Instagram, and then tell me you don't want to know more. And then come back, hit play. It'll be awesome. All right, Rick. So let's let's start with your musical journey. How'd you get into playing guitar? Uh, how to get okay? So, uh, well, I started in band and I played clarinet, and that was kind of okay. And then I switched to saxophone because it was way cooler. And I remember being in jazz band in high school, 
and I'm playing tenor sax. And it, the whole time, like tenor sax is cool, but the whole time I'm looking over at the guitar player in jazz band, I'm like, man, that guy's so much cooler than me. That's <laughs> what I want to do. And my, my grandpa actually, he passed away when I was a baby, but he passed down his acoustic to my dad. And my dad didn't play, but I knew there was always an acoustic guitar in his closet. And so I think I was like not 10th grade. I was like 15. And uh, I went to my dad. I said, hey, do you think I could, you know, maybe try that guitar and maybe learn something? He said, yeah, man, go get that guitar and, you know, go at it. So I got the guitar and I think I had like a Mel Bay instructional book or something. But basically I was teaching myself going to tabcrawler.com and all the different tabs and stuff like that and learning all the wrong ways to play. (laughs) In that age (laughs) before uh, YouTube too. Yeah. Oh yeah. There there was no YouTube back. Well, there was, but it was just, I mean, it had just started. Right. And so, um, I started playing that guitar and you know, what's funny. It was about a year after I realized what I was learning on. And that was uh, a 1965 Gibson J45. Oh my, holy crap. That's yeah. awesome. So, so that's the guitar that I taught myself how to play guitar on. And so. Well, it's my, all downhill from there. That's just. I know. It's like you, <laughs> I started there. And then, so my next guitar. So I will, acoustic was cool, but I wanted to play ACDC. Right. I wanted to play Led Zeppelin. I wanted to play, you know. And so my mom and dad got me a, took me to the local pawn shop and let me pick out a guitar and an amp. And this is where things got a little funny, you know, because I went in the guitar shop and they had a cool guitar. It was a, a Suzuki Strat copy. Okay. Right. And it was a cool looking guitar and it played okay. Um, but the amp I got was a 10 watt gorilla amp <laughs> with, like a master and a tone control. And then I think that was it. Just a master and a tone control, you know, no reverb, I'm, no nothing. You laugh. That's I'm just going to pause right here. I just saw literally, it must've been this morning or last night, a guy in one of the Facebook groups that had lined his driveway with all of his gorilla amps that he had. I was like, <laughs> That's that's a whole lot of awful amp. I mean, that's just a yeah. whole lot. Oh of- man, it, it it was so bad. It was it was so bad. Like I couldn't figure anything out. And what I ended up doing was my mom always sang in church growing up, and mom always had a great voice. Oh, yeah. And she always practiced on a karaoke machine at home. She'd play her soundtracks to the karaoke machine, and she had reverb and delay on the karaoke machine. So I stole her karaoke machine <laughs> or, and and I took that and I started playing on that. I was like, man, this is way much better. It's reverb. Like it's way better than that crappy grill amp. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, things have just been going on, but that's how I got into playing guitar. You know, oh, that's awesome. I just like that. So, uh, you've been playing now for a while. So at what point did it transition from playing guitar to I want to make fancy guitar picks because some of your picks are pretty, pretty fancy. We we talked the other day about one that you made. That's like 9.3 millimeter. And I'm like, anything oh, yeah. over three feels like I'm holding a brick in my hand. Yeah. Yeah. That one was pretty wild. And that guy, he, he custom, like he begged me to make that for him <laughs> and I made that for him, you know? And, uh, it turns out when it gets to be 9.3 and that one had all the speed bells all around and everything. And to be honest, I didn't even try it on guitar. I I don't even know how it plays, you know? Yeah. I just made it and sent it to him. And, uh, I made another one yesterday. It was, it was only seven mils. (laughs) So, you know, but, um, I'm just, I'm just imagining, you know, uh, I'm just imagining, uh, picking up, you know, like, I don't know. That's like playing with a snark tuner to me. That's like deciding I'm going to play guitar with a snark <laughs> tuner. I, <laughs> yes. well, well, you know, it's, it's interesting, but how, how I got into uh, making picks, I'll get back to that. Sure. I guess when I was about 20, I was in college and uh, I, you know, how, that was about the time that I discovered pedals and discovered 
uh, different amps and different tones. And I was going on the tone journey. Right. Right. And, um, I found V picks. I don't know if you heard of V picks. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I've got a couple laying around here. No, I've got, yeah. Picks. So, Is that the same thing? Different thing. Cause gravity yeah, calls V-Picks. some of their stuff V picks. If I remember correctly, look at that. Yeah. There's, there's one. That's the uh, V Pick stiletto. I doubt that's going to focus. There is no way yeah. that my camera is going to focus on that. <laughs> but like, yeah, but yeah, I was, you know, I was working. I was working back then, and I had enough money. I couldn't buy a pedal that I wanted, but in this, ma- I think I had like the uh, Guitar Player magazine or Premier Guitar. I can't remember which one it was, but they had a little ad in it for V Picks. I was like, oh, cool. And so I ordered the starter pack for like. 20 bucks or something came with like right. five picks. And, um, I just remember like first time I had them, I was like, these are really cool. And then I played, I was like, yeah, I don't really like these at all. <laughs> <I didn't. laughs> but when I went back to it, I kept going back to it. And I was like, the more I played it, the more I really liked it. And then um, yeah. the more I realized, you know, how it made, it, it was just a little less effort that I had to put into it. Like it just, it, it came a little easier. Faster runs came a little easier, you know, things like that. Yeah. You had to be willing then, to uh, change your, change the way you played a little bit to use the pick yeah. properly. Yeah. And I, back then I remember I was really, I've always been into classic rock and classic blues, blues rock and that type of thing. And I remember I was really, really into Santana at this time, the V picks. I got the V picks and I just kept on playing repeat on the uh, song Europa. Oh, yeah. And I just kept going on and on and on. And I remember try auditioning the V pick out with like a jazz three that I've been using. And I was like, Oh man, the, it, there's just so much more tone. It's just more everything like better attack, better presence and all that. And then after playing V picks for a while, I went to gravity picks mm-hmm. and I got a slew of gravity picks. They're great picks. Yeah. They're, they're good. And, uh, I tried, uh, I tried, uh, prime lock. Uh, Dunlop prime tones. Oh yeah. And those were great picks. And, uh, but basically all that was going on and, and my brother works with me and he's, he's the other half of honey picks Okay, and he doesn't play guitar, but he's got like an engineer in mind where he works with his hands and he's good with different things and stuff like that. And so we have a laser machine at work. We work together, same place. And this laser machine can cut out acrylic and, we had some acrylic laying around and we both got together and I was like, Hey Drew, you think you could make a, if I, if I, you know, put in like AutoCAD and drew out a pick shape, do you think you could cut it out with laser and we could bevel it? He's like, yeah, that'd be no problem. So we started doing that probably about February or end of January, early February last year. Oh, wow. So this this is really recent. Well, well, our one year inter- anniversary was uh, April eighteenth, and that's actually my birthday too. So, oh, that's awesome! <laughs> yeah, oh, very the same cool. day. So, yeah, it is. It is still a pretty new endeavor, you guys. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's he cut it out, and I started beveling it with like a Dremel tool. Yeah, I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, and the first one we made was really crude, you know, and it just got to the process of figuring out the best way to do it. Uh, a lot of trial and error, a lot of really ugly looking stuff coming out first <laughs> and, until we finally figured out how to make a really, you know, decent pick. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's how that came out to be. Oh, that's awesome. That's, that's really crazy. Especially looking at some of the stuff you're making now, like there's, there's not a whole lot of stuff you're making now that I would say, Oh, that was, that's just a laser cutter and a Dremel tool. Uh, some yeah, looks, yeah, we've come a long ways. Yeah, some of these things, uh, and I'm not going to go through and start describing y'all. I'm going to make y'all go to the the Instagram okay. account and go check them out. But yeah, you got if you have a pick right here, but I don't know if if you'll be able to see it. Yeah, see. that's what I'm wondering. That is, see, they're wild looking. They look almost like polished stone. See, now this has purple heart. Yeah, on each side. Oh, see, that's but it has, but it has case and galolith on the inside. 
So what's what's the thickness on that pick? I can't tell from here. Uh, this one is this one's about five and a half. That's still wild. Like I'm sitting here, you know, this is, this is the amount of research I do. I look through your Instagram and then I got pics in front of me. Like we were talking about, uh, again, more, more see through pics y'all for you watching the YouTube channel. For those of you not, you're not missing a thing on the podcast because there's no way, but this is a, a gravity, like a three mil. I think it's a three mil. It's gotta be real close to like their version of the XL, like jazz three. And then, like, I used, uh, what do they call them? The big stubby, the Jim Dunlops that got, like, real crazy. Oh, yeah. thing. And this is the this is the biggest pick I've ever used. I've never even attempted to use anything bigger than this. <laughs> and I get, and people look at me like I'm crazy when I play these. And oh, I'm yeah. like, no, this is comfortable. Oh, yeah. But, so, so some of the stuff you're making is, is, and, and that's the other thing. Like, I, I look through your Etsy store a little bit and your prices are, are I'm, I'm not going to say too low. I'm not going to say, but they're really competitive uh, for what you're yeah. making because the picks you're making are really, really crazy. And some people say, uh, I say some people, I said, so I'm sure other people have said, you know, I'm not going to spend that much money on something I'm just going to lose. Right? Right. I've said that before and I yeah. joked about it. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to lose it. But then I remembered I've still got all five of the gravity picks that I got back in like 2006, I still had them or whenever they started, it was, I think gravity picks had only been around for about a year and a half when I got them and I still have all of them. I, I, and so, you know, if something's good, you'll hold on to it. You'll pay attention to where it goes. You know, you don't, you're not going to throw your picks out in the crowd or anything. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right, right. Yeah, if you do, it'd be by accident. Yeah, by accident, or you are made of yeah. more money than I am, and you really need to go to <laughs> patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast and spread yeah. some of that wealth a little bit. <laughs> support a brother. Exactly. For for the cost of half a pick a month, you can support yeah. this podcast. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so it's so it's for those of you that have actually, that are sticking around for a, a pick podcast. Picks are completely overlooked by so many players. Um, We'll spend all day arguing the virtue of this brand of string over this brand of string, this material of, of nut over this or that or that or the other and argue, get into fights over this, but you're not willing to change from the nylon pick you've been using since 1992, you know? You got I discovered when I was willing to use uh when I I made the swap from I don't know what Dunlop makes the original like Jazz 3s out of. It's some type of uh, nylon. Is it a yeah, it's a type of nylon, it's got to be. To the acrylic gravity picks. I I realized I had to I had to pull the uh treble back on my amp a little bit because you get a little more attack you get a little more presence you get a little more punch out of it especially when you play something i play p90s a lot that's my that's my pickup of choice and it's very mid focus so if you want some of that high-end attack just changing your pick changes the sound of your guitar completely and people overlook it i like yeah i like to tell people that think of different picks as like different eq tools yeah no that's exactly uh, it you can get a I mean, you can get a much darker sound just by changing the pick you're using. We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by String Joy Strings. I'm a snob, at least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where String Joy Strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. String Joy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coated strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. You should be using Stringjoy Strings, and if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings, I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy Strings today. Yeah, I mean, you, you can change between uh, a Jazz 3 or your V-Pick or a Honey Pick, and depending on the material and the thickness, 
I mean, you got totally different tones, totally different tones. Yeah, they're they're very different things, and it's like, uh, and you see some players get it, like they they won't strum with a thick pick because they like that click of the thinner picks when it releases the string, or they won't, you know, they they need a little more control so they get the thicker pick and they get that. But when you start breaking down to material and the beveling and just like I said, some of yours are actually works of art. Like I, I, I'd be scared to play them because I don't want not because I'll lose them because I don't want to mess them up. They look so cool. That's super cool because they look really, really impressive. And so, like, I'd be scared to wear them. Down. Not scared to. It's like I wouldn't want to because they look so nice. It's like when you buy a guitar that it has doesn't have any dings in it, and you're like you're really scared to oh, ding yeah. it up. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's wild, but. I, I'm I'm gonna order some of yours because I'm gonna have to try it. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to branch out. I'm gonna make myself order something I wouldn't normally play to really try it out, and then like your version of something I would normally play, uh, right? Because more people should branch out and try more picks. Like, don't be so scared of of doing something different. Yes, the price is uh, a little much when you're used to paying a quarter a pick for the little flimsy. Yeah. Uh, Don Jim Dunlop picks, but uh, you're gonna get a significant difference out of it. And in the end, let's we're talking what five to seven, five to eight dollars, somewhere in that range, to yeah. dramatically yeah. change your instrument. Yeah, and I mean, it, it is totally different. I mean, I like I said before, it's like an acute EQ pedal in your hand. I mean, and also if I'm playing rhythm guitar. I'm going to have a different type of feel. I'm going to play a little differently. I'll use a different type of pick for that. If I'm going for a lead thing with some fast, faster runs, I'll grab a different pick. You know, it just, I, it, yeah. I, I, I think of it as a tool you exactly. know, to change my tone. It's a tool so, just like everything on the guitar. It's a tool to get the sound you're looking for. Yeah. And you don't know, you don't know what you're uh, looking for until you try it out. Because I didn't know I needed a different pick. I didn't know I, that I'd like another pick. I was like, oh, these picks are fine. This is what I've always used. Until I was willing yeah. to try something different. And sometimes that comes yeah, I mean, from someone it, loaning you something. You're like, here, try this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like, I mean, I, I kind of think about it also like I think of guitar pedals. Like, I've got certain pedals that I only use for my single cool guitars. And when I go to my humbucker guitars and they just don't sound like a tube screamer yeah. tube screamer to me sounds great on a strat sounds awesome on a strat as soon as i put it on the humbucker guitar i'm like it just don't do anything for me it's mushy you know, it's, it's just, just mushy at that point yeah yeah it, it doesn't do anything for me I, i'm at a weird point in my life with tube screamers i don't i don't actually have one currently like any variation thereof and that's a that's a weird oh, wow. thing for me that's that's not usual um I'm probably going to have to get another one at some point, but um, that's a whole other rabbit hole. That that's that's yeah. a way to get everybody away from us that doesn't like blues rock, y'all. We like tube screamers. It's okay to like tube screamers. <laughs> Stop yeah, right. the hate. Um, I so I went and I went and dug. Uh, for those of y'all that don't catch it, because I, I don't mind saying it, because you might hear it in the edit. We had a little connection issue, so uh, we're connected again. And during the the little break there, I went and grabbed my my pick container yeah i, I try nice. to stay organized um nice. but i had to show you the strangest pick i own i'm gonna see if it'll come through in the camera this is called a stylus pick so i'm gonna try to get it to focus or i may have to hold it back but it's got huh. yeah let me i'm gonna do my best to turn it's got like a little a little ball tip on the end. Yeah, so it's like I wish this camera would focus, but I need to. I really need to upgrade camera. So let's see if I can. There we go. There you go. There you go. So it's got a little. Yeah, that is wild. Yeah, it's got a stylus tip at the end of it. Huh. Yeah, it's real. I really am bad at this, but that's okay. So, yeah, it's apparently, so I found it. I didn't find it. Uh, a buddy of mine found it and gave it to me. We're going to go back into focus here, hopefully. Um, he gave it to me and because he wasn't going to use it. He was like, I just found this in a box, you know, sitting around. And I learned later 
that it was a pick designed to teach you better pick technique. And uh-huh. so, because if you don't play it right, that, that, that ridge at the end before it tapers back down to a point will catch on uh-huh. the string. So right. you've got to play with just like the barest tip of the pick. You can't play with a whole lot of it. Uh, and it is wild. It's very hard to play with. It's very, very difficult to play with. So I don't. I just have it. And uh, <laughs> there's. I mean, I'll post a picture on Instagram. I'll try to take a decent picture of it. But um, it's a wild one, and uh, it's impossible because my technique is god awful. Uh, <laughs> so it's not worth me trying to use it. Um, but that is the strangest pick I own. Uh, I need to. I need to branch out, like. So the, the, oh, what's the word boutique? We're going to call them boutique pick market. We're going to call it the boutique okay. pick market. Cause, cause I mean, I guess that's accurate. I'm going to try to get in. That's kind of what it is. I mean, yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's boutique, small maker guitar picks. And that sounds bougie as hell. That, that just sounds so extra, uh, to, um, yeah. which puts it right up my alley. If you ask my wife, she, she says I'm completely <laughs> extra. So, um, I'm a pretty dramatic person. I, I try to be pretty even keel on this podcast. Y'all get real excited about some stuff. I, I literally <laughs> sang the Lion King song about coffee earlier this evening and my wife would, would you please be quiet? <laughs> oh, <that's good. laughs> so yeah, I, I like coffee. I'm, I'm trying to ease back on my consumption of coffee because it has done really bad things to my voice. Um, uh. so I, I had a gig this past weekend. I developed nodules on my vocal cords a few years ago and I have a coffee and diet soda addiction that the acid in those plus the caffeine drying you out has been terrible for my voice. And so I, I sang my first gig in over a year and did a 45 minute set and my voice was shot. So, oh, man. yeah, so I'm, I'm drinking more water. Um, Trying to yeah. anyway, and way less. Co- In fact, this is my. I had a cup tonight because I was I was fading. I was struggling. It's my first cup of coffee this week, and so <laughs> that's really hard for me. Um, but on that subject, we said we were going to talk about this because uh, I'm really interested to see how it's looking like across the globe, like across the country. You're in. Are you? You're in North Carolina, correct? Right. So yeah. Um, here in Mississippi, things are starting to go back to gigging uh some people are socially distancing and keeping it real safe and outdoorsy some people aren't let's not even pretend about it you know some people are just like ah fuck it we're just gonna do it you know it's just that's it is what it is um neither here nor there i'm not here to get into the argument of masking or not or social distancing or not i'm excited to see um mute live music returning and coming back is, are you starting to Definitely. see some of that over in North Carolina too? Uh, we're, we're starting to see glimpses of promise, promise in a, in maybe the next month, or the next few weeks. Like I know uh, at church, like we've been playing outside, you know, and and we're talking about maybe in the next month going inside. Oh wow! Playing, you know, and so. Um. I can't like we're a really small rural town. Um, so there's not really many gigs here anyway. Yeah. There's the, there's the, uh, ice cream slash coffee shop that has gigs. Uh, but they haven't been doing anything ever since it started. Um, but when you go to outside of our small town, you do hear of some people starting to meet outside socially distanced and, and playing out and that's just now starting you know so yeah oh, that's awesome. it's looking good i'm i'm hopeful for it yeah i'm not i i'm just stating facts here in mississippi most of the churches i know never went to outdoor sermons they either did virtual or they just didn't care it yeah it was really, it was, well that that's a lot of we our church was one of the few that that obeyed the law <laughs> kind of you know <laughs> most of them most of them just was like oh we're having church no matter what yeah you know? and i, sh- I shouldn't say didn't care that's that's a little rough that's that's a little harsh to say didn't care but and and yeah. many of them met indoors but did try to put some protocols in place space yeah. people out you know they yeah. blocked off whole every other pew to put safety distance but uh something that was not done was 
uh, a lot of outdoor and I see, I see it going on a lot around the rest of the country, but it's also Mississippi and summer actually. And Mississippi and yeah. fall is not kind either. I don't, you know, yeah. <laughs> there's not really a fall in Mississippi. We get about two weeks of 70 degrees and then it's just yeah. rainy and cold. Uh, yeah. No, North, North Carolina is kind of crazy about this time of year. Like we'll start out the day at like 39 degrees and we'll end up at like 75. Oh my God. You know, it's like, it's, it's such a, you have to go to work in like pants and long sleeve shirt and then you're coming home and you're just like dripping sweat, you know, yep. <laughs> it's like taking stuff off, you know, you're just getting hot. Yeah. I go to work in the so, mornings sometimes here and I'll wear like a, like a fleece vest or something like that. Cause I don't want to wear a full jacket. But then right. by the time one comes around, I've already sweat so much. I don't want to take the vest off because <laughs> I'm so covered in, and so hot. And I'm yeah. like, well, I'm stuck yeah. in this for the rest of the day. Uh, but yeah, so we didn't do a whole lot of outdoor stuff. This, this, uh, we, I played juke joint festival, uh, in Clarksdale this past weekend and, uh, it was great. Uh, I think the attendance was good. People, uh, were as safe as they possibly could be. Uh, they were actually uh, <laughs> they were actually vaccinated. They had a tent for vaccinations at the festival, which was super wow. cool. So you could get vaccinated at the festival if you wanted to. Um, it was it was staffed by medical professionals. Just these these weren't some, some you know festival <laughs> promoters g- giving people shots or anything. It's like. It's like- Oh, I, I know that guy. Yeah. He's <laughs> does, doing shots now. Yeah, oh, okay. doesn't, doesn't Mike own the bar around the corner? <laughs> you know, it's like, no, that's, <laughs> that's not who was out there giving shots out. Well, I thought he was in pharmaceuticals. But... <laughs> oh, no. Oh, wrong kind. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no. So it was real cool. It was great to see. Uh, got to Got to play outdoor. I got to play loud for the first time. So oh, yeah. something I didn't ex- anticipate though. So I've been playing either here in my studio at, you know, indoor. I don't know what this room is like 20 by 18, maybe not even that. Yeah. It, it may be even smaller than that 16 by 18. I've been playing at that volume and I've been playing, I've played a couple of uh, youth conferences that were handled very safely and we played, and uh, it was all direct, like Helix direct kind of stuff, right? So yeah, this is the first yeah, time yeah. I've gotten to take an amp and turn it up. Yeah. And it was jarring. It was really caught me <laughs> off guard. I was like, <laughs> oh, that's what things sound like at volume. And yeah. I was actually fighting the sound on stage a little bit. Luckily, I got I got sound clips from outside, out front, so it sounded great out front. But I was like, man, on stage, I was actually really it was rough. Yeah, I, I didn't yeah, anticipate. It is wild. It. So, uh, so when gigs return, do you do you play a lot of gigs, or are you mostly a home player? You do church playing. Mostly lately, it's all been like ever since my girls were born, really. Uh, it's been mostly home and church. Yeah. You know, w- what was crazy, I, I got, at, just as soon as my twins were born, I got offers right then. You know, I got offers to do a couple touring things with a couple different bands, and I would have loved it, man. And they were opening up for some pretty cool acts. And, uh, but I mean, kids come first. You know? Absolutely. So I had to tell them no. And, uh, but yeah, Especially I would have loved twins. doing that, but. Especially yeah. twins, your your wife would have felt real great if you had twins, and then you went out on the road and left her with twins. Oh man, one kid, yeah, one kid's she, tough, but she, she would have killed me. Man. <laughs> you know what's funny? When I had when we had the twins uh, for the first three months, I didn't have time to play. I, I literally did not have time to play guitar, and I lost the calluses on my fingers. Oh wow! Yeah, and that's I a had, fun time. And, and it wasn't like it wasn't like I forgot how to play guitar. Like I picked it up. I remember one day I was just like, I don't care how tired I am. I'm just going to pick that guitar up and play. And, uh, I remember it hurting, (laughs) you know, like, Oh, I haven't felt that in a long time, Yeah, you know? And I was pretty rusty, but I mean, when you love playing guitar, you'll do whatever you have to, to to do it. You know, that's absolutely right. I just, I just wore those calluses back on, you know, and just, 
no big deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, um, I, I have a, you know, regular old 40, 50 hour a week job. Uh, I'm a library director. Most people, on the, anyone who's been listening to this podcast for the last few episodes knows. Um, and it, it is sometimes a struggle to either get up in the morning and play guitar and actually, one, work on anything meaningful other than just playing the same three blues licks over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, sometimes it's even harder to come home and sit down and play guitar because if I come home and I I sit down on the couch before I come in here, I'm probably not getting up off the couch. That that yeah. happened that happened last night. <laughs> Actually, I came home, sat on the couch, and I worked late last night. I was I didn't get home until a little after eight, and came home, had dinner, sitting. I sat on the couch, and I woke up at twelve thirty. Had fallen asleep on the couch, and then went to bed. And then I don't, I barely remember going to bed, but uh, <laughs> sometimes you just gotta make yourself do it. Um, yeah. I apparently need to make myself play bass a little more. I, I sat in and played bass for a band. Um, oh, yeah. I think I saw that. Yeah. It was a, like an upright, wasn't it? Well, it was it, low. That would have been even worse. Oh, wow. No, it was an acoustic bass. It was like one of those Ibanez acoustic electric basses. Oh, okay, basses. okay. Yeah. I, so I I, uh, I would, got a message that my, my buddy Kingfish was sitting in for a band, and they were looking for a bass player, and... They couldn't, like, they couldn't find one. Then I was like, okay, I brought my bass anyway. I'll bring it and come play. No big deal, right? I just got to find an amp. And so I tracked down an amp, and about that time, they're like, oh, we got a bass player. I said, okay, you mind if I just bring my guitar and sit in? Like, yeah, so I'm going to go play my guitar. I get over there, and the bass player doesn't show up. So we're we're like, okay, what are we going to do? I'm like... Well, they've got this acoustic bass over here. I'll just I'll just play bass. You know, they've got this little amp, like it was like a Rumble twenty five, like not a whole lot of power, but it was a small place, so it wasn't that big a deal. Um, right. And so I start playing, and I'm playing, and I'm fine. But about three songs in, the blisters on on my hand start to develop, and then I develop on the, the pinky of my left hand from sliding and playing mm. that that. Oh, oh man, it was terrible. It was bad. Uh, and we played for two hours and 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. that is cruel. Oh, it was that rough cruel. because we played with this. I, I feel really bad. I don't even know the name of the guy whose band I was sitting in. I was sitting in because my buddy Kingfish was in the band. We were sitting in with him, right? Oh, yeah. I love that guy. Oh, Kingfish is a complete monster. And they genuinely don't make nicer people. There, there are no nicer people yeah. on this planet. Um, he did it. I had an episode with him a few episodes back on the podcast. I'm gonna, we're, we're trying to get another one to, to line up so we can actually get in the same room, and it's gonna be awesome. But I don't remember the guy's name that we sat in with. But then we finished that, and then uh, the the singer is a woman uh, by the name of Robin. Uh, was the next act, and she was like, "Hey guys." I'd really rather not follow that up with just me and an acoustic guitar. Do y'all mind playing behind me? And Kingfish was like, sure. And I was like, all right, fine. We'll do that. And so we played a whole nother set with, with Robin. And I was like, oh, my hand hurts so bad. Oh my gosh, but, man. But it was such a cool gig. You can't turn them down. Like Clarksdale's such a weird, interesting place. Like, yeah, we've got Kingfish, who is like the most recent in a long line of amazing blues players to come out of a Clarksdale, Mississippi, or at least in the surrounding area, right? I mean, this is the same right. town that John Lee Hooker, Earl Hooker, Sam Cooke, Ike Turner, Muddy Waters, they're all from Clarksdale, from where I'm from. Um, and then there's a legend. Whole, exactly, legends. And then there's a slew of people yeah. nobody even talks about. You've got your, uh, there's a guy that goes by the name of Super Chicken, James, uh, uh, Super Chicken Johnson. He's amazing. Uh, you had, uh, hey, there's just, I'm not going to try to go through the whole list. That that's just too long. It's too ridiculous. Go to the Wikipedia page. You'll see them all. There's, there's so many that come out of it, but then we've also got like the guy that was sit that's playing drums for us. Like, remember this is, you can go on Instagram and see the pictures. If you want to see the gig, uh, the picture doesn't have the drummer who is actually the drummer for the gig. There was another guy sitting in when the, when I took the picture, but the guy that was playing for the gig, his name's Joe Eagle. Joe used to play for Albert King. Joe used to play oh, for Little man. Milton. You know what I mean? Like 
Joe is the shit. Joe's legit. Yep. And Albert King is one of my favorites, man. Man, me too. I play in my blue set when I do the big four hour. I promise, I promise I spend at least an hour on nothing but Albert King tunes because it's just unbelievable. And I don't do them justice and I know it, but that's totally okay with me. Ah, yeah, you, no, nobody can do it justice. No, I no, mean, nobody has only those, Albert. He had those hands, man. And yeah. like Albert King's like, like I talk about playing the same three blues licks over and over again, and with all due respect to Albert King, Albert King played the same three blues licks over and over and again, and that man meant it. Yeah, <laughs> like, he did. Like that was yeah, it. Yeah, he did. He meant it. And so, uh, Joe Eagle, I've played with Joe a bunch of times. Joe is my two degree separation from Albert King. You know what I mean? That's that's as close that's as I'm going to get to having shared a stage with Albert King. That's it. Oh, uh, he's. And you- it's like you're that close, but like you're in Clarksdale, like you're learning like real blues, you know, you're learning the roots of yeah. it all. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's off. I, I, I would love to visit just to sit in and, and listen to the guys play. Yeah. You know? It's wild because you're like growing up in Clarksdale, to be really honest, um, uh, and people didn't really talk about the blues and and it didn't matter. Black, white, didn't matter. Nobody talked about it. Like it wasn't a thing. Yeah. Um, then I moved to outside of Nashville and then everybody talked about Clarksdale. Everybody knew what was in that town. And then uh, I lived in Nashville in 2002 and 2003. Well, I lived in Murfreesboro outside of Nashville. Um, it's just so much easier to say Nashville. Right. <laughs> but. Uh, it's all Nashville anyway. Exactly. Uh, it's Nashville East now. Uh, Murfreesboro's <laughs> giant now. Uh, when I lived there, it was like 75,000 people. Now it's like 150,000 people. It's wow. nuts. Um, so I moved back home, and suddenly there was this resurgence of blues music happening in Clarksdale and this tourism that was starting to happen. People were talking about it now. And so it was real cool because uh, I didn't start learning guitar until late in life. I learned at 18. And, you know, so if, if anybody wants to do the math, I moved to Murfreesboro when I was 21. So I'd only been playing for about three years before I I moved to Nashville. And so, uh, it was, it's a crazy thing. The more and more I realized the people I ran into, the, the people that I saw, like I can remember sitting next to little Milton in a Wendy's before I realized it was little Milton. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Or, or like the time I got to sit down and talk to Honey Boy Edwards. If you know who Honey Boy Edwards is, it's okay if you don't. A lot of people don't. Honey Boy, Boy Edwards was the last living person we know played with Robert Johnson. Really? Yeah. So, yeah, there's my oh, two wow. degrees to Robert Johnson, too. But, uh, yeah, it, and Honey Boy was one of the greatest people. I've talked about his book on my podcast before, uh, The World Don't Owe Me Nothing. It's an incredible book. You have to read it. Um, cool. you, it paints this great picture of the blues migration from the Mississippi Delta into the South side of Chicago. It's so cool. Oh man. Yeah. yeah you, cool. If you like blues, you got to read that book. Um, I need to read that. But yeah, I, and this is, this is one of the things I will sit and talk about Clarksdale all day long because I, I, I think it's that cool. And it's not that like North Carolina has yeah. such a deep music heritage too. Like where you are has got a great music heritage. It's just a different one. It, yeah. I mean, you can, you don't have to travel very far to be able to find some pickers, but it's not, it's not blues and rock. It, I like we got that. Yeah. But what we specialize in more of is like just downright bluegrass, man. Yeah. Like I'm closer to the mountains and the closer you get to the Appalachian mountains, the more you get into the bluegrass. And there's a ton of guys that can just flat out flat pick, just go to town. You know, I, I, I like to listen to it. You know, it's, it's not my favorite music, but, um, it's just all around us. So you're going to listen to it. But uh, there are some amazing, amazing, amazing pickers that play that style. Yeah, there's some monsters. And it's a totally, it's a totally different style of play. Like, it's like I just do my dad blues riff pentatonic scale <laughs> all day long. And, you know, 
I play the same riffs all the time and I can't like bluegrass is so foreign to me to try to play, you know, it just, it's, it's a totally different way of playing. I, th- I think of bluegrass, this is weird. I think of bluegrass sort of the same way I think of blues. The bluegrass, bluegrass has a form and a lot of people don't think oh, yeah. of it that way. There's a form, there's a repertoire that everyone's supposed to know. Uh, just like blues, yep. uh, you can go to a jam and everybody calls out a tune and you're supposed to know how to play Cripple Creek. You're supposed to know how to play, you know, That's right. uh, XYZ tune that they're going to call out. Uh, and they're both restrictive forms of music. People develop voices yep. inside that box. Uh, and yeah. it, to give you an idea of how the, the Clarksdale I grew up with, how out of touch they were with how important they were to the musical heritage. Um, yeah. The Chamber of Commerce in Clarksdale, uh, when I was a kid, would give more money to the bluegrass festival that came through Clarksdale than to the blues festival that was in, in Clarksdale. Oh, yeah. that that's completely backwards. It's completely backwards. Uh, uh, we're, we're not going to go into depth as to why I believe that was done, but I think it had a lot to do with uh with with the um with the race of the people playing blues music at the time and the people who were over yeah. the chamber of commerce not to throw them completely under the bus there are some very wonderful very welcoming people who were on that chamber of commerce at the time but um this is why I'm also not saying even what year it was so nobody can go back and find who these people were but there were there were some really misguided ideas deciding where money went to and where, who, what kind of business and tourism and what we were talking about Clarksdale was known for. Um, right. But you can't, you can't get away from it. I mean uh, that I've gotten to play with so many cool people in Clarksdale. Um, I got to play with Ike Turner's son at one point. That was real cool. He's a piano player now. Mm-hmm. I think he's based out of Tulsa. Uh, like, uh, let's see. Oh, I need to be able to remember this story correctly. Ike Turner's mother was the midwife that delivered my grandmother. Like, really? That's, that's the connections oh, that's cool. in a town like Clarksdale. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, super small really town. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think uh, my mother will haunt me if I got that story wrong. And it was, uh, it was like my aunt and not my grandmother or something like that. But I'm pretty sure that's the way that story goes. I'd hold on to that because that's just cool, man. Yeah, isn't it? I yeah. mean, th- those are the yeah. those are the cool things. Really, what this podcast is becoming yeah. is an ad for your picks and for Clarksdale tourism. I really should yeah. charge them for for cool. this kind of airtime. You, you know, another thing I was thinking about, like the parallel between bluegrass and blues. Another thing that I think about that, like I'm sure you deal with this in Clarksdale, but like if I go into a music store and a guy asks me what kind of music I like to play. I say blues, blues rock, right? right. And there's always the fear of running into that guy who's like a purist, like oh, if he, a yeah. blues purist. And there, and the bluegrass guys are the same way. Like if you say Bela Fleck and Fleck, oh, they're not bluegrass. Yeah, they're not bluegrass. No, nah, nah, Bela Fleck, that's fancy banjo. That's not, that's not bluegrass. Chris that's, Thiele's not bluegrass to them. And, Nickel Creek was barely yeah, bluegrass like, to them. It's like a... You know, Joe Bonamassa, he's not blues. He don't play blues. He plays rock. You know, if you get all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? It doesn't really matter what you want to call it. To me, it's got blues rhythms in it yeah. and blues lead lines in it. And it doesn't matter one way or the other. If you want to call it blues rock or if you want to call it rock, I don't care. That's just what I play. But I'm not going to belittle somebody for not playing a, a 12 bar blues standard and do it completely clean and do it one way only you know yeah otherwise we'd we'd all be bored it's exactly you know? right and that's the thing is like there's so much there the the it's not even just the purists um it's it's often uh just it, it's musicians in general looking for a reason to not like what somebody else is doing um yeah. Uh, what is so? I had Ariel Posen on the podcast a little while back, yeah. and something he said because I I talked about this and it's sort of a stance that I want I want us to start pushing forward as music comes back, uh, and as we as musicians go out and hear live music, 
if we want to complement the bands that we hear, don't compliment the gear first. Compliment the music yeah. first. Like, don't yeah. compliment the thing they could buy in a store. Let's let's compliment the 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 creativity or the skill or whatever it is. You know, even if they are playing, they're playing picture perfect covers. There's not a creative note in the entire set. That takes skill. That's not easy. I don't care yeah. who you are or who you're covering. Um, compliment true. that first. But something Ariel said was that sometimes we as guitarists are not good with compliments. We're not good at giving them. Mm-hmm. And so we default to gear. Or we, unfortunately, now I'm adding my own here. Unfortunately, sometimes we default to negativity instead of trying to compliment yeah. someone and not just tell someone they're good at something. I think Joe Bonamassa, he gets a ton of flack. I... Mm-hmm. His music is not my preferred style of blues and or rock. Right. It's, but I think he's immensely talented. I think yeah. I think he has incredible talent. I think he's a nicer guy than people give him credit for. Actually, if you watch enough interviews with him, he's got a he doesn't take himself too seriously. He he mm-hmm. understands who he is. Um now some of his press releases kind of make him sound like he thinks he's way too much, but um, yeah, he is. He as a whole is pretty much pretty self-deprecating. Uh, he's just a guy who loves playing guitar and loves playing in front of people. And, and he does it. He does a great job. He's obviously got a really good following. Uh, mm-hmm. so I, I don't see the hate there. I don't understand it. A lot of people, uh, want to even hate on like Stevie Ray Vaughan. I'm like, hey, okay, look, Albert King wanted to play with him. So, yeah, you can, I mean, you can bite me <laughs> when you when when you have an album with Albert King. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's one of my favorite albums of all time. Man. I love that. It's a album. killer, it's a killer I mean, it's, album. And Stevie is one of my all time favorite players. You know, just I think I think all of us go through like a Stevie phase where we just want to just like I just listen to everything he's ever done and just binge listen for years yep, you know absolutely. never get tired of listening to him play but i uh <laughs> i've got a i've got a buddy of mine jacob he's a killer he's a killer guitar player love stevie um we were sitting down the other day and we were talking about stevie and we were talking about dumble amps and we were talking about dumble inspired amps and um and we got to talking about it and he was like yeah well he said my favorite albums anyway are stevie's early albums before he started adding the Dumble and blah, 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 I said, whoa, whoa, hold up. I was like, no, no, no. He was, he was trying to explain, he was basically trying to explain away why he didn't want a Dumble uh-huh. <laughs> or a Dumble inspired. Cause no, let's be honest, most of us aren't going to buy, be able to afford a Dumble. Um, no. Dropping, dropping 75 to 100K on an amp is not in my agenda. Um, but I told him, no, no, no he, he had a Dumble on Texas Flood. Like he, right. that was recorded with Jackson Brown's Dumble. He just didn't own one yet. He didn't go on the road right. with one. And he was like, oh, I said, yeah. So that sound you're used to hearing, that's that's Stevie through a Dumble and probably like three other amps, but whatever. Right. Um, I can remember, wait, so there's a, there's, some, there's a magic. Uh, and this is where a ton of people have stopped this podcast. If I'm going to start talking about Steve Ray Vaughan. Uh, there was a that second appearance on Austin City Limits. There is something okay. about that appearance. Um, he was clean and sober. Um, yeah, he uh, brought his. I think that was the one he brought his brother out, and his brother played with him some. And I, yeah, I think that was the best playing I ever heard from him. Was that second episode of uh, Austin City Limits? And I have heard. Derek Trucks, John Mayer, and John Frusciante all reference that second appearance on Austin City Limits as a major influence for them. And oh, it was yeah. it was the same thing for me. Remember, I grew up in Clarksdale, mm-hmm. and it took Stevie Ray Vaughan for me to get into the blues. Uh, because yeah. I remember falling asleep with PBS on and woke up in the middle of the night, and that episode was on when I woke up. I did not go back to sleep. Just did not happen, yeah. and that, that changed my world. I was an acoustic church player until that point. I had no real interest in playing electric guitar or lead electric guitar or whatever you want to call it until I saw that episode. Oh, yeah, 
Yeah, that, and it's you know it's funny you said like PBS. You know, at, it, one of my earliest memories of wanting to play guitar. I was just a kid. I must have been, I don't know, maybe ten years old. And mom and dad got PBS on, and I'm watching this guy up there, and he's got a voice like you've never heard before, and he's up there, and he's just, just, just playing the guitar. And I'm like, Dad, who is that? He's like, son, that's BB King. Oh, I'm yeah. like, I'm like, Dad, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. You know, I was just getting excited, you know, seeing BB King. And BB King stuck in my mind as a ten year old, like, oh yeah, that's cool. I want to do that. Yeah. You know. Well, I'll but, tell yeah. you a fun BB King story. Well, first of all, so Steve Ray Vaughn led me to Johnny Lang, which led okay, me to, yeah, yeah, led, yeah. Me, led me to BB King. And to this day, really, BB King and Albert King are my two biggest influences. I've been really, really lucky. Uh, and I've been through phases. I went through like a Brian Setzer phase at one point. And I was playing nothing but like West Coast swing and like up blues and stuff like that. And I went through a uh, Santana phase where everything was in Phrygian mode. You know, just didn't matter if it was supposed to be. It just was. Um, right. But um, I did... Get a chance. I opened for B.B. King twice um, oh, at, at his homecoming festival in Indianola. Now, here's the thing, though. Yeah. I opened for him. I never actually got to meet him. Like it was that like because he was on his bus and like but he at, he has a he has a museum, the B.B. King Museum in Indianola, Mississippi. A buddy of mine messaged me one night and said, hey, B.B. King's in Indianola the night before the festival. I wasn't playing the festival this year, the homecoming uh, concert. Um, he said, B.B. King's going to do a master class the night before. And I was like, what? Okay. Awesome. And so I got there early, and me and my buddy sat on the front row of this master class, and I sat five feet from B.B. King and his band while he just talked us oh, through man. music. And like... I have this pick while we're talking about guitar picks. I'm going to, I'm going to make it focus on it because it's just too cool not to Uh, wrong way. It's one of BB's picks. These are the cons he would throw out in the audience, but um, this one he didn't throw this one. He put in my hand. You know what I mean? It's like one of those like coolest moments ever. Um, That is so cool, man. But you'll appreciate this. BB King started out on clarinet. He did. He started out on clarinet I didn't know that. when he was like, I didn't know that. I, I can't remember if it was eight years old or eighth grade. It may have been eight years old, but yeah, BB King could read music the whole nine yards. Now he said he wasn't any good at it anymore because he never does it, never did it there. You know, probably since he yeah. was eighteen or older, he never read music again. But he could do it, and he played clarinet. So yeah. that's that's a that's cool, man. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, one of the one of the coolest guys. Um, uh, one of those that I would have absolutely given anything to play with BB King. Uh, that they don't they don't get better than that. They they just do not no. get better. Actually, um, I'm going to shout him out and uh, call him out on it. My buddy Kyle, who's one of the Patreons for this podcast, just bought one of the BB King Lucille's, the Gibson Lucille guitars. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things are so cool. It's so cool. I, I don't know. I'm I'm gonna end up waxing nostalgic about BB King all night if if I don't move on. But so yeah, that was and I'm from Clarksdale. It took Stevie to get me to BB. Yeah, it's ridiculous. That that should That's never wild. Happen. It doesn't happen now. Yeah, Clarksdale's a blues town now. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely started with BB and then went to Stevie, and then I just went through everybody after that. Albert. You know, Freddie, Buddy Guy, uh, and then I got hip to like some of the newer guys, like Robin Ford. Oh, yeah, and that's more like blues jazz. And then Matt Schofield and uh, Johnny Lang, about the same time as yeah. those guys, and uh, Philip Sace and oh, Philip Sace just has a been ton a... of them. They're and they're all they're all different, but they're all amazing players. Sace is Josh new Smith to me. Is awesome. Oh yeah, we, we can't even mention yeah. Josh Smith doesn't even make sense to me, and Kirk Fletcher yeah. is killing Josh, it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Kirk is the man. Like Josh Smith, when I hear him play, and he is like 
and he looks like he's got like sausage fingers, right. man. It looks like you know, but he can play the fastest Stevie lines so clean. Yep. So clean. And it's like, dang, he's like playing it cleaner than Stevie played it. You know, it just I don't know how he did it. And oh. he's using like I think twelve gauge strings or thirteen gauge strings. Yeah, I think they're I think they're bigger than it's, that. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. I mean just I can't amazing. Do it. Amazing. Okay. We we all went through our strat with thirteens phase tuned to E flat at some point. Uh so yeah. but I'll tell you who who my guy is right now, besides Kingfish. I love I love fish, but um the is uh Alvin Youngblood Hart. I think more people need to be talking about him. Uh Alvin Youngblood Hart, he's been around a while. He's not a he's not a young cat on the scene. Check him out. Okay. He does everything from straight ahead acoustic like acoustic Delta blues um, yeah. to he had a progressive rock three piece at one. Okay. Point. He plays it all and he's a monster at all of it. Uh, huh? Yeah. So if you, yeah, ever, if you get a chance, check out Alvin young blood heart. I would think that I could, I would know him yeah. from at least something. I mean, I've, I tell you maybe what, I'd, I've seen him, but I just don't recognize the name. That's possible. It's very yeah. possible, but I would, I would definitely check him out and give him a listen. Uh, like I said, he's done everything, recorded and put out everything from acoustic Delta blues to a legitimate, honest 120 decibel progressive rock trio. <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you what, uh, Rick, we've been going for a little bit and, uh, I want to, we're going to wrap things up here in just a little bit, but I really appreciate you coming on the show, talking about your picks. Uh, if yeah, you've made it this far in the podcast uh, or YouTube video, <laughs> thank you. Cause we have, congrats. yeah, congrats. You, you deserve some applause. <laughs> uh, uh, I am a fan of you at this point. Uh, there yeah. are going to be links below for uh, honey picks going to be links below for all of my uh, 40 Watt Podcast, social media, uh, Patreon, the whole nine yards. Check those out. Uh, uh, hope to hear from you. Email, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Patreon, however you want to get in touch with me. I'm around. Uh, Honey Picks, Rick's, Rick is around, and he's ready to make you some picks. Uh, I promise not all of his picks are the seven and nine millimeter no, no, monstrosities no, no. we talked about. I talk about those because those <laughs> are the those are the really interesting ones. You do some uh, pretty straight ahead just with, you know, your own style. Yeah. So there's all kinds of options available. I'm going to be ordering some here in the next couple of days. Try to get some in and uh, try those out and hope that I don't fall too much in love with them because uh <laughs> I, I'm scared to fall in, in love with expensive picks because then I've got to have a collection of them, you know, just in case. It's like it's That's like right. having guitars. I need a backup to my backups backup. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, I'm going to let you go, uh, and I appreciate you coming on tonight. And uh, yeah, I guess for the rest of y'all, uh, y'all take care of yourselves, uh, be good to each other, and make some noise. Yeah, man. This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.